Hello YouTube, it's Halloween tonight, and so to be in the spirit of the season, I have decided to share two stories with you. Two stories of encounters I've had with paranormal entities or things that I just couldn't explain that personally scared the living heck out of me and that I think you're going to find very interesting because if I'm sharing them with you, it's because I couldn't quite understand what was happening to me back then. And still to this day, with hindsight, I cannot place exactly why these things happen and what caused them. And I'm fairly skeptical. Uh, I don't really believe in ghosts. I don't really, you know, put into faith into stories of people who get abducted by aliens or they see a dark figure in the night. Because to me, there's always a flow in our argumentation or story or the memories that they bring forth, I can always pinpoint something that isn't right. But for those stories, there is nothing. Meaning that there is nothing rational I can grasp that can help me think, oh, it was just, I can explain it. This is what happened. I, in these scenarios, I have nothing. And so I want to share with you because one, they're very spooky. And two, I wonder if maybe you guys can help me crack it. Maybe help me understand. So let's get started. The first story is the shortest one. The second story is longer with more details. The first one happened five to six years ago. And it actually happened the first time I put a foot on the American continent. And it was something that was happening very quickly. It happened the first year I started studying in an American university. The place where I studied, the campus at least, was very special in its disposition and what it looked like. There were towers with at the center what I call the camp, camp base, that was surrounded, as I said, by those structures. And there were four of them, meaning that there was a, a main pillar in the center, and then there were four towers surrounding it. And so there was the north, south, east, and west. And when you walked into the town, the campus, that's the first thing you saw, because you could see it from a distance. It was immediately evident, and it, it had an aura to it. It didn't look great. Um, I grew up in the projects. It looked like a project and not the good type, meaning that... It was made of bare concrete, it was dirty, the windows were tiny, and it was very vertical. And something that I found with that type of towers is that the more vertical they are, the more bad news, bad news they become. That's just an instinct I've developed living in that type of tower for 20 years. So <laughs> the first time I actually made it into that country, I remember looking at this thing and thinking, that can't be right. That can't be the dorm. It's not possible. So I kept looking around town to find a place where I was supposed to sleep, found nothing, and then I had to just come to the realization that, yes, this was going to be home from now on. So I went there, and, you know, the first time I visited the tower where I was living, which was the South Tower, I entered my room and I couldn't believe it because the room was bare, the, all of the walls were white, the floor was bare and white, the ceiling was white, and the only thing in the room was a bed frame in the middle of the room, made of steel, no mattress, no pillow, no nothing. That was a rough first night. And it wasn't just because of the lack of comfort, it was mostly because the entire place was cold. It's tough to explain, but you know some, some areas or some houses, you enter and you feel at home, you feel peaceful. This was the opposite. Like The first thing I felt in there was... I'm being threatened. There's, there's something going on here or this is not a place that wants me to be there. I, I cannot explain it better than that. But I was actually lucky in a sense because that was the South Tower and it was not the best tower, but not the worst because it was built in the 80s or 90s. So it wasn't super old. Out of all of the towers, the best deal was the East Tower. It was the most recent. It was very comfortable. It was cheaper. On top of that, they had the cafeteria and also had a laundromat. So all of the good, the good core cool stuff was all concentrated East Tower. My tower had nothing. So I was forced to go there for food and I was also forced to go there to do my laundry. And the laundromat was always very popular because they had TVs, they had a lounge, they have baby food so people would hang out as their laundry was being done. And I did that every single Sunday. 
just like with any college students, I waited for the last second to do my laundry. And in my head, this was the only, only laundromat available. But one day, for some reason, 50% of their machines and their dryers went out, meaning that you couldn't use them. And that created a problem because, as I said, everyone waited for the last second to do their laundry. So there was a massive, well, back, back up, a backlog of sort of laundry, and people were queuing up to put their laundry in there, which I wasn't going to do because I hate waiting, at least in that respect. And so I was going to just say, well, I'm going to just sting for the, the rest of the week, who cares? When I heard two guys say, well, they were discussing and they were laughing, and one of them was saying, oh, we can do laundry tonight. And the other one told the guy, hell, we can still go to North Tower. And they both laughed and they left. And I told myself, wait, there's a laundromat in North Tower? No one told me that. Plus, it's not on any brochure or anything. And I've never heard of anyone doing their laundry there. Everyone comes here. So what gives? Then I looked around and I realized that people were still queuing up. That made no sense. Why are people waiting if there is a free laundromat? So I told myself, oh, maybe it's busy, just like this one, but that, that didn't add up. So I told myself that actually, most likely the reason why the guys were laughing about it is because the North Tower laundromat was a secret, right? Maybe it was a well-kept secret by the people of North Tower so that if there was that type of scenario, they could keep it to themselves. Maybe even the, the North laundromat was better than the East one and those bastards were just keeping it to themselves. So I told myself, man, I'm so smart. I'm going to go to North Tower and all of these idiots are going to keep waiting for nothing. So I took off my laundry and I went. And to go to North Tower, you have to exit east, you walk down a corridor, you enter Camp Base, then you go up and you enter north. The first thing I felt when I entered the North Tower was that there was something wrong. And it wasn't a vibe or anything at first, it was just like observations. The, the floor was completely bare, the, the walls were completely bare. If you ever lived in a dorm, people like to put up stuff, they put up posters, these graffitis. Here there was nothing, it was just clean, pristine, which again is strange because from what I knew of hearsay, North Tower was the most ancient towers of them all. So that didn't add up. And then the floor was bare, as I said, but more importantly than that, it was clean. And I live in a region of the wood where there is snow nine months out of the year. So there is also sludge everywhere and students don't care. They don't wipe their feet. So there's always marks of sludge on the floor, even if the staff tries to keep it clean. This time there was nothing, meaning that I couldn't spot a single mark of anything on the floor. Looked like no one had been there for many weeks. And on top of that, there was no noise. Dorms are noisy by default. Here there was just plain silence and there was no one in the entrance of North Tower. The entrance is where all of the people go back and forth to take the elevator. For this one though, there was no elevator. The elevator was there, but it was bared. You couldn't take it. And the laundromat was in the basement, whereas in East Tower, it was actually located on the first floor. So I went down and uh, the staircase down wasn't the most inviting because you couldn't see shit. It was just plain darkness and Whichever genius designed that place decided to put motion sensor lights on the ceilings. So the only way to get light would be to move. But worse than that, you couldn't activate the light so that it stays up. So that if you stop moving for five seconds, you were plunged in darkness immediately. And on top of that, the lights turned out in five minutes, in five seconds, sorry. And the second you exited the area where the light detects, it went out. Meaning that there was no connection between the lights. Each light was independent to one another. So as I went down those stairs, I couldn't see in front of me because the lights in front of me were not activated yet. And it, when I turned around like this, all I could see was darkness because the lights behind me were turning off as I was going. And I, every time I heard click, 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 which wasn't, it wasn't super comforting to be honest with you. And I also told myself, man, this is terrible logistics because what about people who have a ton of laundry? I had my own luggage with me but for the people who have like massive baskets, it's impossible to navigate those stairs because they were very tiny. So I go down and I go down and the lights turn on in front of me. And the more I go down, the more it feels like I'm going down into the abyss because there's no light behind me. And then I finally reach the laundromat. And the way the laundromat works is you are down the stairs. It's a corridor and it, 
it opens itself up as a big square. So I go and the lights flash up and the lights are bright, meaning that if the lights in the staircase were way too, too timid, these ones were blinding and they immediately made me uncomfortable. I couldn't tell exactly why, but they were too white, too present. And they were, you know, it wasn't a, a light bulb or anything. It was like rectangles put on the ceiling that all turned on at once by motion. So it, it, something in me was, a memory was awakening, but I couldn't remember what. I knew that this light reminded me of something, but I couldn't tell what. That's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed was that there was no noise. And the problem is that a laundromat is a noisy place because there are washing machines going, there's dryers tumbling. Here, there was nothing. So I was immediately made aware that not a single person was doing their laundry there. Why? East Tower is, again, stuck. People need to do laundry. I could see 50 washing machines empty and open. Why is no one there? As I'm thinking that, I hear click. And I'm thinking, oh, someone else is going down the stairs. So I look down. I look, I look down the corridor to look at the stairs, pitch black. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, the person is going to come down eventually. Who cares? So I go and I realize also that all of the machines are old so that you can't pay with a credit like a card for the campus. You have to pay with coins. Thinking, okay, I have my coins on me. I have for my parking spot, so it's fine. I have my quarters. So I start putting my shit in one of the washing machines because they're all open. They're all open. I couldn't understand that as well. They were all open and empty. So I start putting my stuff in there. And the more I put my stuff in there, the, the worse I felt. I felt like someone is watching me. And that feeling washes over me as I hear another click. And I turn around to see that the light at the entrance of the corridor is on now. But no one is there. And I don't get why, because those lights were really, really aggressively uh, hard to, to actually turn on. The detection was really shit. So I'm, I'm telling myself, okay, they're just, you know, they're just bad. It's fine. Uh, nothing is happening. So I put all of the, the, the clothes in the washing machine. And I go to close the washing machine. And as I close it, I do this. In the thing, you know, this, the, the thing where you can see your clothes inside, I catch a glimpse of someone behind me. Not immediately behind me, but in the corner of the room. And I immediately jolt back and no one is there. Now, of course, the first thing I tell myself is, okay, you're stressed out. It's, it's normal. It's because it's, there's no light. It's creepy. You're by yourself in a basement. There's no one there. You just look. There's no one there in the corner. As I tell myself that, bah! behind me, two or three of the doors of the washing machines slam shut. Turning around again, no one is there. This is the moment where I was trying to freak out a little bit because I was telling myself, okay, there's a little bit of a, there's too much going on. I don't know what's going on, but I'm, I'm not a fan. And I hadn't started my, my, my cycle yet. So I could always take it back. I had just closed the door. I go, I go to empty the thing, can't open the door. Meaning that for some reason it's locked, but the cycle hasn't started. I cannot open that door. As I try to open that door, more noise behind me, more clicks, still no one in that stair. I, at this point, I left. I just took myself with my, my foot and I just went down one of the stairs and I was like, I'm done. I didn't like the ambiance of the place. Beyond just looking at a figure that apparently was behind me, it, I felt watched. I couldn't explain it, but I felt watched. And I went up the stairs and when the lights went on on the stairs, I felt better. And I told myself at the top of the stairs, you know what, you're being ridiculous. You're 20, you're fit. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of a ghost? What is this ghost going to do to you? So I went down again, uh, convinced that I was going to run that cycle. And I, I get down again and this time... I'm a man, I'm not going to be afraid of anything. So I, I, I punched uh, the, the right number for my student code. The thing doesn't work. So I try to brute force the thing, doesn't work. I try another washing machine, this one doesn't work. 
And then, as I'm trying the third washing machine, one of the washing machines that had shut by themselves starts running. And I hear that there's something in it, meaning that it closed, it was empty. All of them were empty. When I entered, they were all open and empty. This one, there was something in there, something heavy, something I had never heard in a washing machine because I'm, I'm making my own laundry. I know what closers sound like. This sounded like a body. It sounded like a human body, a small human body, a baby in there just bouncing around. At that moment, I open my washing machine. It lets itself open as the first one resisted. This one was fine. Grab my clothes. But before I go, laundry less, because I couldn't manage to make it work. I just want to, I want to see. Because fuck it. I'm already so deep down the rabbit hole. I might as well see. And I go to see what's in there. And as I go in the washing machine, I see nothing. It's pitch black, meaning that the, the, the glass was completely obscured. I couldn't see what was inside, but I could still hear the noise. And call me an idiot, if you will. I grabbed it and I just pulled it open. Empty completely empty. And the second I opened, of course, the security went on. It stopped. And uh, I just left, grabbed my shit. And I just was like, all right, it's so it's done. I'm not going back to that tower anymore. I'm just going to leave. And I left. And what I realized on top of that was that all of those washing machines were washing machines dryers, meaning that they were all the same model. And the way it was is you were walking down the corridor and all of them were on this wall right there. So you were forced to face them right there. And the corridor was on your back, which added to the entire atmosphere also. So as I left, of course, I had to turn my back to that entire wall of washing machines. And I heard again, slapping of doors, closing of washing machines and a few of them starting. So I didn't run or anything. I was scared shitless. And I just went up. And I went and I queued up like the other idiots that weren't the idiots. I was the idiot. Because what I found out afterwards was that the reason why the two guys were laughing to themselves is that North Tower is haunted. And everyone knew it, but the only person that didn't was the French kid that just got in town. And the reason why North Tower was haunted is because my college and that dorm in particular used to be, drum roll, not an, uh, I was going to say Egyptian, not an Indian cemetery, but it used to be a hospital. And North Tower in particular was the main area of the hospital and they built on top of it. So it wasn't a tower to start with. It was a basement and a first two floor and they, they built more on top when it stopped being a hospital after World War II. And then they constructed more around it. But North Tower always had a reputation for being haunted. And the reason why no one used the laundromat is that everyone knew because the people who didn't tried to use it once and they all reported the same thing. You couldn't run a cycle, even though when they sent people to fix the machines, they worked. Machines would start by themselves. People would hear footsteps in the stairs. The lights would go on. They would see forms and figures in that very particular room. And that room in particular, as I said, the basement turned out to be um, in French, we have a name for that, but uh, the, it's, it was the L where they put people who were going to die. Meaning that it wasn't the morgue, but it was the place where people were going to die. And to me, that makes a ton of sense because this is what I felt. I felt dread in that place. I felt like I didn't belong. And whatever was there, also I agreed that I didn't belong and they wanted me gone. I wasn't attacked or anything, but I was... I felt like something was trying to intimidate me. And this was also the reason why no one wanted to live in North Tower, which is also the reason why no one was making any noise because the tower 
is empty. I just never knew that because when you come towards the big path and the main street, the first tower you see is South Tower and North Tower is facing a big forest. So you can't see the windows. You can see that there is no light there. But the curse of that place didn't just stop at North Tower. First off, it claimed the life of many people because come to find out, North Tower was a place where four students killed themselves, the students who lived in the dorms, and the other towers were also affected. After that, I found out that the noises I was hearing every single night before going to bed weren't from my neighbor who was just dancing. It was a spirit, poltergeist, I don't know. But I found out like six months afterwards that there was no one living on top of me, and yet I was hearing noises all the time. So knockings like this on the walls. And it was especially bad when people were having parties. So I don't know if the spirit was disturbed. Uh, I was the one who was having to deal with that because it was just above my face. There were lights. When I would walk from the gym at night to go back to my tower, I could see my floor. And then on top of my floor, I could see yellow and green lights coming from the windows, like something glowing. But no one was supposed to live there. So I'm thinking maybe someone who was squatting who knows? Uh, I never got an explanation because they never found any living person there trying to just, you know, live in the place for free. So that was my experience in that place, in that, that what used to be an ancient hospital. And I'm very happy I left that place because, again, as I said, it wasn't comfortable and I never really felt rested or at peace there. I always felt watched. I always felt like I was trespassing. I was imposing on something that didn't like to be imposed on. So that's for the first story. The second story is more detailed, more interesting in my opinion. And the one that I have the most questions about because I still don't get what happened at that moment. But before I start, let me check the time. Okay, so the second story happened in a certain place in the mountains that I'm not going to cite because it's where my ancestors lived and it's where they still live. All of my family is still there. What you have to know about this place is that it's very remote. There's no internet. There's almost no TV. It's the simplest type of life, simpler. Um... It's said to be, in my language, in the language of my ancestors, the land of witches. We believe that this is a place where people were witches. They were witches. And we know, quote-unquote, witches, meaning that there are women in the area that people tell you, hey, be careful with that person, be very respectful to them. If they salute you, you salute them back. If they offer you food, you say no, etc., because they are witches, so be careful. And I grew up in that culture as a kid. Um, because I spent two months every single year in those mountains. And these were the best months of my life. As a city kid, being in the middle of nature, the big forest, the mountain, it was, it was amazing. And I was never afraid. I was going out into the fields, into the, the deep forest by myself when I was eight. I wasn't afraid. And no one in my family was afraid either because it's a fairly peaceful place. I mean, there's no real danger in there. And so as I explored, I went further and further, and I never ran into anything that could actually pose a threat to me or anyone who lived in the area. The worst thing that we had was uh, wild dogs. There were packs of wild dogs, but that's pretty much that. And they were a little bit afraid of humans. They usually hunted sheep. But there was, in that peaceful place, one specific spot that was always shrouded in mystery. And... It wasn't super far. It was actually only 15 minutes away from where my house was. But I had never managed to actually go in there. And no one in my family had ever went in there. And the reason why was because we were always told as kids that we were allowed to go anywhere we wanted, but there. And of course, when you're a kid and you hear that, the first thing you want to do is to go there. So we organized expeditions with my cousins, with my friends, and we wanted to see what was up. Why couldn't we go there? And the place in particular, so that I can describe it for you, it was after a long walk on what is essentially just dirt, a dirt road with fields on the, on the sides, 
you reach a place where there is a massive field and the field is like a perfect oval. And the field is surrounded by forests here. And near the entrance of the forest, there is uh, what we call a girouette in French. You know, it's one of those things that you put on the, in the... Usually it's on the roof. And when there's wind, they spin. So that it tells you where the wind is and what direction is the wind going. And that thing looked like a... It looked like a, a fan. It was like a fan made of steel that was like 30 feet off the ground. And it was fairly useless because we had always noticed that it never moved when there was wind. When there was a ton of wind, it just remained static. But we had also noticed that when there was no wind whatsoever, it spun like crazy and it made a ton of noise. And as I said, it was right in the entrance of the forest. So then there was forest. And I mean forest. If you live in a big city or even in the suburbs, I'm not talking one or two trees. I'm talking forest so thick that you can't see one meter into it. It's immediately dark. You don't see shit. And the trees are immense. They're gigantic. So it looks like a mass trying to submerge the field underneath. And next to that field on the left, there is a path that continues. And the path continues into the forest, of course. And when you walk up that path, you eventually reach a point after walking a little bit where you're faced with a wall. And it's not just any wall. It's a wall that is made entirely of tree trunks. So it's like if someone, for some reason, wanted to stop, uh, stop water or like to make a dam. It looked like a dam on earth, like on the ground. And it was just tree trunks on top of tree trunks with like sticks put in between. It looked, it was massive. It was maybe six or seven feet tall, which was massive at the time because I was much shorter. But you have to think about the work it takes to put all of these things together. And it looked dangerous. It, I can't explain why, but there was an aura to that thing where it looked, uh, it looked foreboding. That's the word. It looked foreboding. So as a kid, my favorite occupation was to go onto that field that precedes the forest and look at the wall from a distance. I never dared come close to the wall, most likely because my grandpa had always warned me to never go through it. And I respect my grandpa to this day because he is a man of great wisdom. So I never wanted to actually go against his word. So I just ignored it, but I, I would keep coming back just to watch it year after year. And we never actually tried and, and go to, uh, through it. But the one thing that we would do is we would question people in the family because we were curious. And the question was, who made that wall? And for what? What is the point of that wall? And what we were always told was that the wall was there to prevent wild beasts from coming through and going into the village so that they couldn't just walk down the, the dirt road and enter the village where there is sheep, there is people. That made no sense whatsoever. One, because as I said, there is no wild beasts in those mountains. The worst is packs of dogs and they stay away from the towns because they're afraid of humans. We have wolves, but you should see our wolves. They're tiny. They're so tiny to get bullied by the dogs. And they are so pathetic that when I was a kid, I could go into the forest. My grandpa just told me, hey, grab a stick. And if there's a wolf, just hit the floor and they'll run away. And they did. They were very afraid of humans and they were way too small. On top of that, it was a place in the wood where all of the wolves were exterminated by humans. So there wasn't big packs of them. It was like a few scragglers here and there. So the wolves were out of the equation. There's wild horses, which can be dangerous if you get too close, but they're not aggressive at all. They run away. The one dangerous animal that I can find, find in these mountains was a boar. We have wild pigs that are actually quite dangerous because they're very aggressive and territorial, and they will charge you. And there are cases in those mountains of people who got killed, gutted, and eaten by those pigs because they're omnivorous which might be the worst death possible. Imagine that, being charged by one of these things, and then it devours your entrails as you're still alive. But the problem with the pigs was that we had massive issues with these fuckers because they kept going into my grandpa's field and eating the potatoes. So if they were capable of doing that, I don't really see how that, that wall that was just, again, tree trunks, was supposed to stop them from going anywhere. They were always there. So that explanation was bunk. It didn't make any sense. On top of that, 
It was strange to even make a wall out of tree trunks because the place where I'm from in these mountains is the home of architecture of the entire region. That's where all of the people who make houses live. And everyone in that village makes their own house. They build it themselves. So why exactly did they decide on that day to just say fuck it and build a wall with, with branches when they have the ability to make a normal wall? I also found it strange because the wall clearly looked to be built so that it could be destroyed. What I mean is that it looked like if the right person pulled on the right place of the wall, it would just fall apart. It looked like it was built to not be permanent. It looked like it was built to not be an absolute. It's the best way I can describe it. And on top of that, it wasn't just the wall that was strange. It was the disposition of the place. Because as you walked into the forest, you entered, you saw the wall, and near the wall, there was a stair going up because the wall was here. And on the side, there was a massive cliff. And then on that side here, there was another wall, but this time made of stone. And that place up there, we went with my grandpa all the time because there was uh, racines and roots and there were uh, the marron, uh, I don't know the name in English, and we would grab them and we'd make soup with that, we'd put them on fire, it was great food. And so it was always weird to me that we were allowed to go there by ourselves if we wanted, but not in there because as you were walking on the, on the, the thing up there, you could see some of what was underneath after the wall, and it was just normal dirt. But then you reached a point where trees were so thick that it created like a bubble where you couldn't see anything, you couldn't see what was underneath you anymore. And so we never really saw what was there. And of course, curiosity was devouring me because I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. Why did someone build a wall that is not really preventing any human from going through. It's not stopping wild beasts. It's just there. And I'm told I'm not supposed to go through it, but I can go on top. So one day with my cousin, we said, you know what? We're going to go explore it. Right? There's no wolves. There's nothing dangerous. We're going to see what is up. So we went and we didn't just climb the wall. We went around it because as I said, the wall was protecting a big corridor and so it was easy to just go up that wall on the side and pass the wall and then jump. And that's exactly what we did. And we jumped on the other side and uh, looking around, it was normal. It looked like the dirt road just, be, just before us. But looking on our peripherals, I noticed that if on the right was a cliff, on the left there was, as I said, another wall. But this one was special. It was made of stones and it was made of perfectly sculpted stones. They were all the same size. And they looked like they were just stacked on top of each other. And they were also clean, perfectly pristine. And the problem with that is that even though the people in that region are quite good at making houses, they're not very prone to aesthetics. So they don't really care if the houses look good. They just want it to be solid. So usually they just take any stones that they can, they sculpt them in any shape, and then they put it together and they put concrete in between so that it sticks. This was made by hand and it was clearly something that could be easily destroyed as well because I remember tugging on one of them and it just, it slid right out. Like when you play like uh, the game that like Americans like when you put dominoes on top of each other, the Jenga, I think, Jenga, it was like Jenga. So I put the thing back and I was like, man, that's strange. On top of that, as I said, it was spotless. All of the houses in that village are covered in moss because the people who live there are all geezers because all of the youngins left to go to big city and all of the old people were left behind. And so they don't clean their houses because they don't care. So why exactly was that wall so clean? Are you telling me that someone comes every week just to clean the moss from that? That makes no sense. There wasn't even dust on it. Like I could do this and look at my finger. There was no dust. So that was strange, bizarre. And we just went and advanced, right? We wanted to explore. The goal, was, the goal was to see what was beyond the wall. And turning back, I remember looking at the wall behind me and thinking, hmm, it looks menacing from the other side, but from this side, it doesn't. It looks pathetic. A feeling that I, again, it's tough to tell you what I felt at that moment, but I felt like the wall was, was sending supplications my way. It was telling me to stop. It was telling me to come back. It's like if the wall was trying to make itself look better so that I would want to come back to it, but I just ignored it. 
And so we kept walking and we couldn't really see what was in front of us because the way it worked was that it was a slope like uphill at first that then continued into, as I said, the thicket of the forest. So we couldn't see exactly what was going on because afterwards it looked like the, the terrain was going to be flat. So we were here walking like this and there was something here that we had never saw and we wanted to see what that was. And there was a stream on my right because there was a cliff and there was trees there and so the water would run down the mountain and the water would afterwards collect on a tiny bit of stream. And I was an expert on animals because I collected bugs, I would, I would uh, tame the wild dogs, I knew all of the animals that lived there. I remember going into the stream just to see if there was some tadpoles, I liked to, co I liked to, I liked to collect them to make frogs. And uh, I grabbed, there was something in the water that looked like a little fish. And I grabbed it in my hand, I remember looking at it, and it was um, a water bug. If you know water bugs, they actually bite, they really hurt. But this one was special. It wasn't trying to bite me because it had no teeth. And I was trying to figure out what it was. It was completely transparent. And I couldn't see what the head was because it looked like there was no head. It looked like just a, a, a rectangular shape. And then I realized that the head was in the middle of its body. So it was the shape of a water bug without the teeth, but instead of having its head here, it was like on top of its body. And I'd never seen that in my life. So I looked at it for a second or two, trying to think, man, I know every single bug there is. I've never seen that thing in my life. And I couldn't understand what it was. It puzzled me, it, it, it scared me a bit. And I put it back in the water and we kept walking. Uh, at this point, my cousin is completely oblivious to all of that. He's just walking, he's eating the walls with his sticks. I have a stick too. We walk and I notice another thing. I notice that the the girouette, the fan at the at the entrance of the forest is going crazy. It's it's spinning, it's spinning, it's spinning, and it's making its metallic noise. There's an and there is no wind. More importantly, there is no wind. There is no wind, and yet on my left there is the wall, and on top of the wall I can see trees, and I do not know what these trees are to this day. I still don't know. I could never find their replica in any book. They were thin, white. They looked like they had leprosy. They were losing their skin. I can't explain it. They were like someone had peeled them. Someone with a lot of strength had peeled these trees. And they were just moving. But they were moving in nothing because there was no wind. And their movement was very eerie because it was slow and measured. And they were all independent to one another. It was almost hypnotizing in a sense. And they didn't look like a tree should look. And they didn't move like a tree should move. I, I know how trees move when they're being bullied by the wind. They move aggressively back and forth. The, wind, the, the leaves move. The leaves were completely unmoving. The only thing moving was the trunk, like this. And they were not the same trees that were made, that were in the walls. Important to say. Seeing the trees move made me realize another thing. We couldn't see back because the wall was hiding where we came from. But most importantly, we couldn't see from the other side of the wall. We couldn't see what was on the other side of the wall. And it scared me because I remember that when we went up to collect the roots, my grandpa always told me, hey, you always want to be able to see where, where things are around you. You don't want anything to obstruct your vision because bulls like to come from the top of the hill and they like to charge people because you have no way to escape, right? You can't jump the cliff. You would, you would break both of your legs. And so I was wary of thinking, man, what if there is like something? I couldn't tell why, but I was, I had picturing myself a wolf, but not just any wolf. I was picturing a, a, a wolf the size of a human that would walk on, on his four legs. And I was picturing that thing on the other side of the wall, just waiting for the right moment to pounce because I have too much imagination. So I was starting to get scared and I started to move away from that wall. And the more we moved forward, the more I was moving away, the more I was coming towards the cliff, the more I realized, man, if bulls do sometimes charge people here, what if there is one that is waiting on top that just jumps on me because they're stupid? So now I was walking straight in the middle and my cousin was still doing his thing. And the more we walked, the more I was starting to grasp the disposition of the terrain and the, the, the cartography of the place. Essentially, it was like this. It came out as a straight line that went uphill after the wall, and then it opened itself up to something we're just about to reach. 
And so as we were reaching that place just before we went up to see what was in that space, there was something that caught both of our attentions immediately. There was a dark hole on the trunk of a tree. And it's very common in areas with wild uh, foxes or wild, uh, wild bulls even. They like to dig into the roots of the trees because it makes, makes a nice little house. But this one was the biggest one I had ever seen in my life. It was big enough to accommodate three bears. And it was super round and deep where we couldn't see through, right? Usually when foxes make that type of thing, it's not super deep. This time, it looked like even the entrance of uh, a cavern. And I remember seeing that, again, puzzled, because what animal did that? That's way too big. And telling myself, man, are there bears there? Because I could see on one of the entrance of the hole that there was hair. And it was hair that I recognized, quote unquote, because I had seen that type of hair on grizzly bear. But the place where I was in those mountains doesn't have bears. There's no bears there. There's nothing big enough to feed a bear. I mean, maybe the horses, but I never heard in 500 years of history of anything like this. Because the thing with that place is that where we're located, it's an area of uh, Europe, I can tell you it's in Europe, that uh, was placed in a country that was invaded repetitively by, uh, by armies of many kinds. But the one area of the entire country that never got raided was this place for a simple reason. The mountains were too rough. And it's funny to read because I love to collect books from invaders who try to take over the land of my ancestors to read their reaction when they reached the place because every single time it's the same thing. They're like, okay, we conquered the rest of the land. It was flat. Then we arrived to a place with massive mountains and forests and we just couldn't get through. The, the, the forest and the mountain was too much for us. On top of that, there were savages in there with with fur like beasts and axes that are just too much to fight. We have lost too many men while we are going back. There's not even a, a reason to invade this place. It's just a bunch of savages will just go back. I say that to tell you that we are no, we have no certitude with what lives there because very few people have actually explored that region of the wood. And so I was telling myself, man, maybe it's a species of bear that is just particular to that region of the world, right? And I was starting to get scared because I was telling myself, man, if there is a bear and if it's a grizzly bear, we're on his territory and maybe that's the reason why we're not supposed to be there. Maybe they know that somewhere in that space there is a bear and they try to put the wall to prevent it from doing anything, even though I'm thinking it's useless because a bear would be able to tear down that wall or even climb on top of it or destroy the wall. So as I'm thinking that, I see my cousin becoming pale and he's looking directly like this. And I look at him for a second. He's not looking at the hole at all. I'm looking at it for a second. And I go like this. And on top of one of the trees, those tiny trees, there was a massive black thing. Huge. And it looked like it was just there. I couldn't see a face or anything. And it was on one of the trees that was slowly moving back and forth. And I looked down at my cousin and we didn't, we didn't say anything. We turned around and we bolted. We ran with everything we had, jumped the wall, jumped back down. All the while, the, the fan from the entrance of the forest is going insane, insane. It's spinning like there's no tomorrow. There is still no wind. The trees are still moving. There is still no wind. We jump and we run home. And all the time we're running, the only thing I could think of was that there was something behind me. I could feel something right behind me. I could feel its breath on my neck. And we sp I had never run that fast in my life. We sprinted with everything we had. And when we made it, outside of the periphery of the forest and we finally saw the fan we both stopped for a second completely out of breath okay we're both kids out of breath completely the forest is just dark darker than usual the fan is still going insane but it's better now 
And we turn around and we both look at the wall. And I remember looking at that wall and thinking to myself that I was grateful that it was there. I couldn't tell exactly why, but we both knew that once we had passed the wall and walked sufficiently far away from it, that we were safe. None of us was afraid anymore uh, because we, we had the intimate belief that whatever was in there couldn't pass the wall. I cannot tell you why still to this day, but I still have that belief. I think that this thing couldn't pass the wall, which makes no sense because, again, there's the, there's the, the thing in, on the side. There's, it makes no sense. And we walked back home, and the last thing I did, stupidly, I shouldn't have done that, is I turned back when the forest was still in view, and the last thing I saw was in the trees, I saw a black thing. And that thing looked like a bear mixed with an ape. And it was looking directly at me. And I still remember its face. And if I do this, I don't see shit, okay? I didn't have glasses back then. I was already uh, nearsighted. I, I saw that face. I don't know if I imagined it, but I, I remember that face. And that face haunted my nightmares a ton because I would keep having the same nightmares of that thing managing to go past the wall, entering my house and killing everyone in my house. It never happened, thankfully. But that was the first and the last time we ever went past that wall. First and last time. And I haven't been in five years, but from what I gather, and you can tell me what you think based on what I told you, what I believe is that there is a thing in this region of the wood that has been sealed in that area. And for some reason, the wall made of tree trunks and the, the, the walls made of stones and the area around it is enough to contain it. It cannot go anywhere. That's all I can think of. I don't know what it was. Still to this day, I don't know. When I ask people around, they don't know what it was either. I don't know if it was just my imagination as a kid. But all I know is that both that first story and that second one to me are true because they happened to me and I cannot find or explain a reason that would justify what happened. I cannot. And so these were my two spooky stories. I hope that it was a good time for you, maybe a little bit scary, just entertaining. And for tonight, I'm going to leave you with that. There is a massive video coming this Wednesday, so I decided to do this little story time for you guys so that we can relax before the big stuff hits. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.